Welcome to Global Perspectives. Who are the Yazidis and what is their story? For answers, we turn to filmmaker Dusan Takal, the director of Hawar, My Journey to Genocide. Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me here. So tell us a little bit about the Yazidis. The mm -hmm. Yazidis we've heard about in recent years, but we still know very, very little. Mm -hmm. well, what is the Yazidi story? Mm -hmm. The Yazidis are one of the oldest religion in the world, over 4,000 years old. And we are living between Iraq, Turkey, Syria, and Russia. And our holy spiritual center is in Iraq, one hour away from Mosul. And um, there is our holiness as well. And we have uh, a lot of similarities with the Jewish religion. And um, the sad thing which Jewish and Yazidis have in common is the dehumanization because of another religion. And that what ISIS done to our people in 2014 made us popular and famous in a very bad way. So the world noticed who we are. But what we Yazidis, we've been massacred since uh, hundreds of years. So this is the 72nd massacre against us, what ISIS has done to our people. We're going to come back to that in more detail, but, but tell us a little bit about the religion itself. Mm -hmm. This has been called the world's oldest religion mm -hmm. by, by some scholars. Mm -hmm. what, what is the essence of it? Mm -hmm. We are a monotheistic religion, but uh, we have seven angels, and the name of one of our angels is Meleki Taus. And Meleki Taus uh, is like a figure, a reflecting figure, who don't accept uh, everything which is uh, saying to him. So therefore, this is a very self-confident religion. And uh, it's an oral tradition and religion. We haven't got a holy book like the Torah or the Quran. It's um, transmitted by oral history. And we are one million Yazidis over the whole world. And 500,000 are living in Iraq. And uh, in that moment, uh, we have 500,000 refugees. And um, the un other ones are in diaspora. Mm -hmm. And so the, the biggest population of Yazidis outside of the Middle East is in Germany. How did that happen? The first, come, um, the first Yazidis come to Germany uh, at the end of the 60s, uh, like my father, for example. And uh, then the other one followed, um, for example, the other Yazidis which were we been there. And so we become uh, a huge community in, in Germany. And um, this was the first time when we could ask ourselves um, how to uh, go on with our religion. Because since that time, this was just a story of uh, surviving. So we won't be able to be part of education, for example, or to ask ourselves who we are, where we are from. And therefore, uh, this is a thing which is very new. For example, we don't have uh, so much literature or research about the Yazidi religion. And the reason for that is that we always been massacred and that the Yazidis um, in their home countries had to be quiet and um, yeah, won't be part of education and went to school. For example, my father, a very intelligent uh, man, uh, he hadn't got the chance to, to follow his school because his father uh, was in fear because uh, the, the, the problem was when they went to school, education in these countries always meant Islamization. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it was a big problem. So it must be especially difficult to be both a Yazidi and a woman. Mm -hmm. how, how, tell, tell us about the complexities of that issue. Yeah, I, I think as a Yazidi you are a minority in a minority in a minority as a woman, for example. But um, the good things, in my opinion, is that you, um, that you, when you raise and born, you know you have to fight uh, for being free, for being a woman, for being Yazidi. So therefore, I think you have to be very resilient. And in times like these, I think this is something which is very important. And what we try make, to make the people understand is that minorities, for example, from the Middle East are the part of solution, not part of the problem. Because we knew that kinds of terrorism um, 
many uh, and hundreds of years and we knew how to survive it. And therefore I think um, um, I don't regret to be a Yazidi and even I can choose uh, another religion. But uh, you find a feeling for yourself and you understand very well what that mean to be a minority. And in times like these, for example, when the, um, gen we are talking about an ongoing genocide, the role of the woman became very important and many rules are changing. So tell us about your interest in doing a documentary about the Yazidis. This was something that mm -hmm. you had planned to do mm -hmm. before the Islamic State uh, mm -hmm. actions in, in, in Iraq. Mm -hmm. So how did all of that work? Mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, uh, since I remember my childhood, uh, this was our plan. Our plan means the plan of my father and me. And I remember I was four years old and my father took me to the German parliament and said, uh, look, uh, this is the German parliament. Uh, they make um, um, laws. They are talking about democracy. Um, it's about justice and right. And I want my daughter, me, in this moment to become a politician or a journalist one day. And I asked him why. And he said, uh, because you have to tell the story of our people, of the Yazidi people. So. I think that was the reason why I studied politics and German literature and why I became a journalist. But the problem was that no one was interested in our story. Since the day in 2014 when ISIS came to Sinjar. And that was the moment uh, when I understand that the combination of being Yazidi and a journalist has just to mean that I have to go there. And that was not very easy because that was one week after James Foley was beheaded. And it's, it was a very critical moment, but uh, for me it was like I have to do that. It was like a mission and fear was no option. And uh, this, this was something which I shared together with my father. He had the same feelings because I grew up in the way like this how we influenced me. And um, this was the reason, um, for example, why he came to Germany, because they, he hadn't got a good life um, in Turkey at that time, for example. And therefore, we know that the moment uh, was coming that we have to go there. And um, this is how the, my journey to genocide begins. So t tell us about the situation in 2014. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was your thinking as mm -hmm. this assault started mm -hmm. to occur and, and, the, and the Yazidis were clearly one of the main targets? Mm -hmm. um, I became a lot of calls from Iraq, from our people who are living there. We are a very small religion, so the people know each other and they heard about it that there in Germany is a um, Yazidi journalist and they asked me, it was like screaming, it was not an asking, they were mm -hmm. crying and um, they were in fear, they were scared, and they were talking about ISIS, and we didn't know that since that day. And it was like, for me it was like, um, like a nightmare, and I couldn't believe that uh, there are some men with long beards and coming to Shungal in this night, but uh, that was the truth. And uh, therefore I made my decision overnight, and um, I went there as a journalist and come back as a human rights activist, because what I saw there was a life-changing moment. It uh, changed my completely life because uh, I couldn't believe what ha could happen in times like we have today in the 21st century and that what ISIS done to our people is against of civilization of all of us. For example, um, the women which are still in the hands of ISIS, we are talking about an ongoing genocide. We are talking about 3,300 women who've been raped, who've been sold in slave markets, and um, uh, they are about uh, seven years old. So I remember uh, two girls, one eight years old, the other ten years old, and the ten-year-old girl said to me, uh, I, I, I went to the ISIS fighter and said, took me, not, not my sister, for example. I remember of a child soldier, his name is Yamin, and uh, he ran away, but his brother is still there, 13 years old. So we are talking in the moment about 1,000 Yazidi uh, young 
um, boys who are in the hands of ISIS as, as child soldiers. So we all know about this um, um, ISIS propaganda videos, but the kids uh, we, which we saw there are all Yazidis from Kocho, for example. And to know that, it hurts, to be honest. It hurts, and what helped me a lot of was to take the distance to being a journalist. And uh, just to feel it without the distance, it's not possible to go on. And uh, I had many hard moments because I saw a lot of orphans who lost their parents in that night. And I'm sure that in that night when ISIS came to Sinjar, many people uh, were like killed by being um, afraid and scared because of the shock. So I think this moment um, cannot be f for forgettable. And we have to remember that, and this is uh, the part of my work, what, what I'm doing. And that was the reason that I took my camera and um, make it possible that the people could tell their story. And um, I was the first person who met Nadia Murad at that time in a small tent a few minutes away from the front line in Iraq. And um, I didn't accept, and she as well, that two years later we will meet each other at the United Nations when she became um, UN ambassador for human traffic and dignity. So both of them for, for us was surreal. And um, the reason why we came to US, for example, is on the one hand to say thank you for the big solidarity and the interest of the people and uh, to make this ongoing genocide touchable because I think you can't read about the genocide in books. You have to tell the stories behind the numbers and you have to tell what's happening and what's going on. And okay, for example, it is in Syria and Iraq and seems to be far away, but we have similar problems right now and we have a lot of challenging times also in Germany and I think also in US right now. And it all begins with the pictures of enemies. And I think the Yazidis are a very bad example for that, what happened to people when we let that happen. So what I, um, what I am dreaming of or what we would like to achieve is that we have to fight, we have to really fight for a better world of peace and humanity. And we need some, like in science fiction movies, lonesome warriors who are fighting for a good world again. Because when I talked the last few days with uh, a lot of uh, students, for example, from many uh, different universities, the people are very scared and afraid about what's happening right now. And to show our documentary, on the one hand, is very um, awful. I know that. It's sad. And uh, a friend of mine la said it was like to use a weapon. But on the other hand, I hope uh, that we can spread the world and spread hope and show we are still here, we are still fighting, and um, they don't will get my fear. For example, I've been attacked uh, also by emails from ISIS fighters, uh, from radicalization people, and we are still going on, and this is our answer. So what I hope is that uh, we would be possible one day to to move on and to be brave uh, in this new and challenging times because the Yazidi people at that time haven't got the chance, but uh, they, they, they stand up and they, th they said, okay, I know I lost, for example, Nadia Murad, 45 members of my family, including my mother, but I'm still here and I'm still going on and I'm telling what happened to me at that time. And I think to remember uh, is one of the uh, most important things and there is a special understanding between our people and the Jewish community. We have a mutual understanding to each other and I'm so thankful for, for, for the help and the ways of awareness which we get there because our NGO comes from the base. So when I come back from Iraq, I come back as a human rights activist and I understand very soon that to being a journalist is not enough for our people. There have been comparisons drawn between this crisis and, and the Holocaust, for example. Yes. And a lot of people see the targeted extermination, enslavement, et cetera, of, of an entire group of people. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. I think what happened in the Holocaust is something which you can't compare to anything sure. to make that clear. The fact that we are now talking about an ongoing genocide is a real shock after that, 
after that what happened at that time. But I think we have to make clear also for students and young people that the Holocaust doesn't come from hell. It begins with the pictures of enemies. And this is why we are saying, okay, this documentary is about the Yazidi genocide, but it's in general about what happened to human beings. So our work is like the, to do the race awareness of stand up what happening or what could happen to human beings. And this is, I think, the reason why there is a mutual understanding because survivors of Holocaust know what does it mean and they feel the pain. And for example, when we were at the United Nations, it was very important for us to spoke and meet um, survivors of Holocaust. And we are working on projects because in the next years, unfortunately, many Holocaust survivors or the last one, one will die. But we, we should never forget what happened at that time to remember the people, how important democracy is and how sin it is and that we ha have to fight for democracy and human rights every day, every day, uh, to give the right answers to that, what happened. And I wrote a book, for example, in Germany with the t title German in Danger, why we have to fight for our values. And this book couldn't be possible after my personal experience in Iraq. So when I come back, it was like, we don't do enough for, for human rights and democracy. And it was like, I was shocked uh, that the people are lying in their comfort zones and just screaming what have to change, but nobody is stand up for himself. And I said, we have to be very careful. And that was a time when the people said, D Germany in danger, oh, it was like, um, uh, seemed to be populism. But all the things which I write it down become truth. So uh, therefore, I, I think um, we have to be honest to each other. And uh, what I experienced was when I came back that war makes you very honest and clear. So because it's about all or nothing. It's enemies and friends. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, um, I think, um, yeah, we have to discuss this kind of things. And in this book, I'm talking about the evil twins. And the evil twins are the radical Islamists on the one hand and the racists on the other hand. And in my opinion, it's, both of them are doing the same. And they are fighting against us about our values. But I think we have to bring back our values to the majority, not to the minority who is louder than we are. And this is something I think which, which is very actual also here in the US. And in Europe as well, we will have an election uh, in this year and uh, we will see what happened. And uh, I think we have to stand up from our comfort zone and what we try to do is to mobilize the people, to sensibilize them and to talk about uh, how things like that are happened. And for example, in Germany, we are doing that uh, with school talks. Uh, we are doing the, that with uh, sport projects. I have a sister, she's a, a soccer uh, player in Germany and we made some projects with refugee girls and also German girls to give them the possibility um, of knowing new role models, for example. So when it comes to the last, it's, uh, of course, it's about gender on the other hand. And I grew up with a grandma who was very brave and who became an age of 107 and who always took her gun with her, but she didn't use it. But she was fighting for a uh, woman's right, for example. And when our shapes were stolen in Turkey, she went uh, to the police station and said, uh, this is unfair and uh, I, we need justice. And she was for me uh, my, my first role model. And um, I hope that uh, it's possible that we can take her spirit to spread the world for this ongoing genocide and um, for that what happened to our, our people. And I'm, to say it again, I'm very thankful and happy to be here in US, uh, to be invited by the universities or on TV station to talk about what happened to us is something which is very new because no one was interested in it before. No, no one was yeah. interested. And I think you make a very good point in Germany, in the United States, and in other countries where democracy is strong, people take it for granted. But they don't realize that despite the strengths, there are some fragile aspects. And you have to keep strengthening the system to make sure that something 
like what happened to the Yazidis doesn't happen to some, some group here or someplace else. It could happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. It really could. Yeah. So maybe this is something which we minorities knew from the beginning because we know that you can't have democracy or being free for grant. You have to fight for it. And maybe uh, this is something which I meant with uh, to being part of the solution, which we can talk about together, that the main reason is not where you are come from, it is where you are standing together. And there are a lot of people who were talk about the American dream is a legend. I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. The American dream is important for all of us. And we are working, me and my sister, who is here today with me, we are, we are represent, represent, we are represent the German dream, for example. And uh, our lives, uh, I, I, I can't imagine it would be possible one day uh, in this way. But I think everything is possible. And uh, we have a lot of to do, I think. We have a lot of to do, and therefore, uh, we have to react in a new way and uh, we have to also to be honest with our problems which we have. So um, I think this maybe is the second thing which uh, why the racist and uh, radicalists are so successful because uh, we more and more become quiet and we have to be more brave I think and we have to talk about what's wrong in our societies as well and uh, what are our challenges and uh, then I hope uh, yeah, we, it would be possible to live in a better world than we have today. I think your documentary is strengthening that, that conversation and you've shown it all over Europe, the United States, you showed it at the European Parliament. What, what has been the response and, and perhaps more importantly, what are people inspired to do mm -hmm. now that they know more mm -hmm. about the problem? I think the race awareness is important, but it's not enough. So we have to use this race awareness and spread the world for action and changing moments. And to be honest, the Yazidis need our help. They still need our help. And we are talking about a re little religion without rights, without so well-known education. This is something which is very new for us. And uh, without the supporting from US, from Canada, from Europe, um, they, they will be disappear, really. And we have so, much, so many similarities with the Jewish community. But the big difference is that we haven't got a holy book. So that makes it very difficult to overlive in the diaspora. So I think to develop our religion, it's the most important thing that there will be a chance to go back uh, where our places, our holy places are. The problem is they are far, one hour far away from Mosul. So the fight which is going on there at the moment is not for the human rights of Yazidi people and the religious freedom. So this is something which we have to spread the word and say we have to insist and make it possible and we don't just talk about Yazidis. What's about the Christian people? It's the same. They have the same um, situation right now. Christian women were raped as well. They haven't got uh, human rights there as well. So when we are talking about fighting for values, we have to fight for our values also in the Middle East. And we have to make it possible that our Christian Yazidi people have the possibility to live there in freedom. And all that, are, that they want, I talk to them, is to be secure and to be safe. They won't come, come to Europe or to US or Canada if the life were better there. And this, I think this is something which we have to stay strong and uh, accept the responsibility which we have, that we have to take an interest in it. We're, we're coming to the end of our show, but if there's one point that you would like to leave with our audience in our remaining seconds, what, what would that point be? Maybe it would be that um, when that happened to my people, I went there. But I knew about the genocide which was happening in Rwanda, but I didn't go there because it was not my people. So I hope we can sensibilize ourselves to stand up for everyone and for people who I need. And it's not important which religion they have. It's important that when there is something and there is a cry for help that we have to stand up for him, then we will stand up for us as well. Great. Well, I would like to thank you, Duzan Takal, for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for Global Perspectives. I'm John Bercia.
and we'll see you next time.